welcome to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Lisa Watson, City Club's President-Elect. For over 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and explore. We're gathered at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB or viewing on Open Signal or YouTube. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine, and our current Friday Forum sponsors are Family Care Health and Northwest Natural. Please show all of our appreciation for all of our sponsors. The recently completed Oregon legislative session resulted in a balanced budget, passage of a large $5.3 billion transportation package, and some progress on other issues, but there were a number of big outstanding issues that lawmakers punted, including corporate taxes and PERS reform, as well as a comprehensive housing bill. Today, we'll debrief the highly contentious legislative session and discuss bipartisanship in the Oregon legislature. Joining us today is Dr. Jim Moore, political science professor and director of the Tom McCall Center for Policy Innovation at Pacific University. He's been, in, he's been an independent political analyst in Portland since 1990. He's currently writing a biography of former Oregon Governor Vic Atia, the first Arab American governor in the United States. John Horvick is vice president and political director at DHM Research. In his decade with the firm, John has wedded his passion for community-based politics with his expertise in opinion research. He regularly presents on issues of community, policy, and governance, and provides DHM's political commentary. John is also a former president of City Club. Please welcome our speakers. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, this is uh, wonderful to be back at City Club, uh, an organization that means a lot to me personally and a tremendous amount to our community. Um, so th thank you and to the board and to all the members. Um, so the premise today is a bit around the myth of bipartisanship, or is, there, is bipartisanship a, a thing that's real, something that we should worry about, and how does it compare across time? So I want to make a few quick remarks on, on how I, as a public opinion researcher, think about that question uh, and how I see Oregonians wrestling with some of these issues. When we talk about partisanship, I, it's often paired with this idea of polarization. So sometimes the words are used inter interchangeably in, in public conversation. And I do think they're, they're quite different uh, and are manifesting themselves quite differently. At least if I think of polarization, as our Oregonians, our Americans, now taking more extreme views, make, taking more extreme positions on issues in the past, and are the left and right moving further away from each other on, posi on positions? Are they being more ideologically consistent in their positions? And I don't think that there is much evidence for that. Uh, we can look at uh, some, some various high-profile issues, for example, if you look at opinions around abortion, they've been basically stable for the last 20 years. If we look at positions on gun control, Americans are actually coming together uh, on their, their closer to their um, uh, sharing opinions on gun control than they were in the past. Uh, if we look at uh, so same-sex marriage, we see growing support both among Democrats and Republicans on same-sex marriage. Now we can find certainly issues where there are growing divides, but in some of the, the hot button issues over the last 10, 20 years, I don't see a lot of growing uh, polarization among the electorate, which is not to say that there isn't differences around party. And let me give you just a, a few numbers. In the mid-1990s, Pew Research started asking a question, do you have a very favorable, somewhat favorable, somewhat unfavorable, or very unfavorable opinion of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? In the mid-90s, about 20% of Democrats and 20% of Republicans had a very unfavorable opinion of the other party. In 2016, it's now about 60% of Democrats and Republicans have a very unfavorable opinion of the other party. And we see this difference, too, in Oregon. 
A question that DHM asks regularly and other pollsters ask regularly is, all things considered, is United States, or in, in this case, Oregon, headed in the right direction, or are things off on the wrong track? If I look back at all of DHM's surveys that ask that question, back to 2000, Democrats and Republicans tracked very closely together from 2000 to 2008. If you look at the right direction numbers between 2000 and 2008, there was about a nine percentage point gap between the way Democrats rated the direction of the state and Republicans did. From 2009 to today, there's been an average of about a 45 percentage point difference between the way Democrats view the state, direction of the state, and the way Republicans view the state. This idea that we are growing apart on issues, I think, is probably overplayed a bit in the media, but we are definitely holding much more negative opinions about the other party. And I do think I want to, when we think about these issues and how we talk and wrestle with these issues, um, I think that that difference is notable and probably uh, as important or more important than our opinions about some of the issues. Those numbers are fascinating. Um, when you look at them and then look at how we perceive politics, here's the thing to think about. We as the electorate, we as people who pay attention to politics, in effect are in a different world than those who are practicing in Salem or especially in D.C. right now. I don't know if any of you noticed, but D.C. finally had a bipartisan bill. Republicans and Democrats agreed there should be sanctions against Russia. They didn't quite agree on what they ought to be, and the president's not cl clear he's going to sign things, but that was like the first bipartisan thing in, in a long time out of D.C. Here in Oregon, it's, it's fascinating. We, and we'll talk about some of these issues as we go on here. When you look at the big things, so you look at PERS, you look at tax reform, you look at the health issues that were passed um, with some taxes in there. Julie Parrish wants to have a, a, a referendum on those taxes. You look at those big things. Wow, it looks like there's partisanship going on here. But, you know, the Oregon legislature, as I checked last night, uh, there's over 600 bills that they passed that are going to the governor. And when you look at them, just kind of a back of the envelope uh, look at them, about 80 to 85 percent are passed in a bipartisan fashion. They're passed 51 to 9 in the House. They're passed 22 to, to 8 in the Senate, you know, or, or, or almost unanimous. So the, much of what they do down there is bipartisan. There may be partisanship in the committees as they're moving towards getting the final bill, but then everybody comes together. But then you get to the big things, and in fact, the sexy issues. That's where we see the splits. That's where we see people say, wow, was this the most partisan legislature we've had in a while? I would argue that it wasn't. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things happen just because that's the kind of the top bills, the top issues that people are focusing on. The thing is, we, the electorate, those of us who actually make decisions on who serves in, in these seats and things like that, we don't pay attention to anything except those top ones. Unless it's our particular neighborhood, we just don't pay attention to the bill that passed 60 to nothing in the House and 30 to nothing in the Senate because it wasn't our particular uh, you know, building down the road or whatever it happened to be. And so there's, there's a fantastic disconnect and connect going on between what we see in the media, here in the media, and then what's really going on in the legislature. The legislators themselves, though, they have to play that partisan game because that's the way Salem works when you get to these big, big, big issues. Well, let's, let's talk about some of those issues. And so, uh, DHM were regularly in the field asking Oregonians questions about uh, the most important issues to them. And one of the questions they ask a lot is, what's the most important issues that you would like your elected officials to do something about? So we did a statewide survey right at the beginning of the session where we asked that question, what, what do you want your legislators to do? What do you want to be accomplished in legislative session? Well, if I look back in time, the answer to that question, the, the big three are usually education, jobs and economy, and something to do with spending and taxation, right? Sometimes some other issues will get in there, perhaps transportation, perhaps public safety, but those are the, the big three. However, any one of those issues, maybe 20% of the voters will say that's the most important issue to them. Right? So if jobs and economy comes up at, at the top, that means that 80% of the people said some other issue was the most important to them. And some of the issues that I, city club members, people who pay a lot of attention to the politics, people who are in public policy, often don't rise to the top. Let me give you an example, PERS. 
per is when we ask that question, or we ask the question, what's the most, most important issue? Maybe one or two percent will tell us that, that PERS is the most important issue. Climate change, maybe one or two percent will tell us climate change is the most important issue. And there's often not much of a difference between Democrats and Republicans. Republicans may be somewhat more likely to say jobs in the economy, maybe a little bit more likely to say something to do with taxation. Democrats may be somewhat more likely to say something about funding for education. But broadly speaking, if you ask Oregonians what are the most important issues they want their legislators to do something about, they're pretty similar. And yet, the legislature has to make some choices. And from your perspective, Jim, what is driving the choices about what the legislator takes on and uh, where those conflicts uh, most emerge? Yeah, so here's the ideal world. What the legislature will take on is what they campaigned on in the campaign. Because that's when we get to decide, oh, who should sit there? And we expect them to say, oh, that was the issue. That's why they got my vote. They should go and do that. That is, however, not the way it works. Um, and it hasn't worked that way uh, forever. Um, you can go back to the very first Congress, and I'm sure they were out there campaigning. And then they went and they, to, to, to Philadelphia at that point and, and said, yeah, I think there's other things we want to do. Um, and, and so there, there's, that's the first disconnect. So when they get to Salem, there's kind of two main patterns of the way issues get there. First is the leadership. Um, it, the leadership drives a lot of this, and it can also be the minority leadership can be involved in that discussion, and sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But the leadership really drives a lot of that. The second thing is, and this is the way big things get done in Oregon, there will already be things in the pipeline that they've been talking about for one, two, maybe three sessions, and this is the time when they're ripe. We've got new people who've been elected, or the chairman say, of the committee say, this is when we're really gonna push this, or you know, any of a combination of things come through and say, aha, this is the time we've been talking about this off and on for the past four years, this is when we're gonna do that. An example of that shorter time frame was the transportation package this time. Transportation package, everybody wanted it except the Republican leadership two years ago. And so we finally came together, we saw the transportation package be eight plus billion dollars, go down to five plus billion dollars, it got the votes, it, it got through. Things like that. But you think about other things, I mean this is the, the bottle bill came through this kind of a process, the land use policies we have came through this kind of process, all those things do this multiple time. So if you're a new legislator, they have uh, a, ways in which you go down there and they give you, you know, here's how to be a legislator, here's all these kinds of things. What they really need to do is say, oh, by the way, here are things that are in the pipeline that you're, you're going to have to know about. Because uh, that, that's, that's where a lot of this comes from. For those of you listening on OPB, this is the City Club, Portland, the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm John Horvick, Vice President and Political Director of DHM Research. I'm here in a conversation with Dr. Moore. Well, let's continue this conversation about transportation, because that was the big funding package that was uh, a past this session. In our survey research, we really have seen transportation emerge as a more important priority for Oregonians over the last, I'd say, three years, but especially really the last one or uh, the last year. And if you're, you live in the metro area, you certainly have experienced the congestion that drives a lot of that frustration. So in our work, we do see that there is bipartisan agreement about the problem. So about two-thirds of Oregonians, whether you're talking metro residents or rural residents, will tell us that they're not satisfied with the conditions of the road, and about half of Oregonians and higher in the metro area will tell us that they're not satisfied with traffic conditions. At the same time in our surveys, when we asked about support for the actual funding measures that were considered, Barely half supported any of them. And by the way, Portlanders, the most support was for the bike tax, including relatively high support in the Portland metro area. So given an environment where Oregonians are telling us high priority, high priority issue, but the funding mechanism's not well supported, uh, how did the legislature manage that dynamic? Well, it, it, they managed it in a very interesting way. Remember, two years ago, the big issue that the Republican leadership had was that the Democrats in the legislature had passed the clean fuels bill. And so that was out there and they said, oh my gosh, we can't have that, and in fact it's gonna be a tax, it's gonna hit jobs, that big thing, especially in, in more rural parts of Oregon. And so they said, unless you change that, we're not doing a transportation package. It didn't get changed, it was kind of on the bargaining block again this time, it didn't get changed, and so we got the transportation package. But think about the transportation package. Initially, it was over $8 billion. 
Um, and this is not for next year. This is spread out over a long time. But it is originally for $8 billion. And what they discovered was the major funding mechanisms for that just didn't have support. And they also, the, the, in effect, the $3 billion that they cut out was really focused on Portland. And there's a real upstate, downstate dynamic that has been around since forever. And that dynamic was clearly there. And so they go down to the five point whatever, 5.3 billion um, that they ended up with. Uh, Portland projects are still there. So I live on the west side, excited to see anything that happens to 217, yay. Um, but uh, we, 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 we will see those still those Portland things, but it's spread out kind of more equally in the entire state. And if you travel the state, John, John makes a point of going to every county every year. He knows the roads. I grew up in southern Oregon. I'm up and down you know, fairly frequently. You know, the roads are a mess, and they have been for a long time. So here's a fun thing to think about. In my uh, uh, research for the Vicatia biography, his first time as governor, 79. Actually, the budget is good. The main thing they do is they give over $700 million back to taxpayers. Uh, then the economy crashes and they say, where's that $700 million we gave away? But a big part of that was, was not just property tax relief and things like that. There was also a, a transportation package that they, they put in there. At the time, the transportation people said, thanks, this is wonderful, kind of $80 million around that, that realm. We need $240 million a year for the next 10 years to catch up. And that's kind of where we are right now. We need more money than is in the package to catch up, not with just making 217 better, but all the retro stuff we have to do with old bridges and everything else. And so then the funding becomes fascinating because you don't want to raise taxes, but especially in the budget this year, there was no wiggle room. In fact, they had to kind of go, they had to ratchet everything back. And so how do you fund this kind of thing? And so what we will see in Portland, possibly in the future, I kind of doubt it will happen, we may fund it with tolls eventually. Um, other parts of the country, they say, yeah, why not? We do that all the time. But here in Oregon, <laughs> we're not going to have no stinking tolls or a stinking stale sales tax. I pulled on, pull on both and uh, not a lot of support for either. <laughs> exactly. And we can get there, right? It's a starting position. Maybe we'll have to get in that direction. Well, let's talk a little about, about reform. So we had last election cycle measure 97. Uh, it failed overwhelmingly. Uh, we could uh, sort of relitigate why why that happened, uh, but it, then we went into the session. There was a lot of talk that perhaps revenue reform would be uh, part of the agenda, and I think fairly fairly early on in the session, uh, we realized that it, it wouldn't happen, and, and perhaps going forward. But the dynamic that we see sort of I think shows some of the tensions. So let me just again, I'm a pollster, so I'll give you some numbers. When we ask Oregonians, are individuals, small businesses, paying too much in taxes, about the right amount or too much, well, overwhelmingly, Oregonians, including liberal uh, Democrats, say that individuals and small businesses are paying too much in taxes in the state. Large businesses, however, you get a majority of Oregonians say that they're paying too little. Sounds like an environment for Measure 97 or some other funding package that's around that. On the other hand, if we ask the question, do you think that Oregon um, should increase taxes and increase funding for services, keep tax rates and service levels the same, or cut taxes and reduce funding services? Well, only about 25% of Oregonians framed that way will tell us that they want to increase taxes and increase funding for services. So think in 97, overwhelmingly failed. The legislature really didn't address funding reform this session, and it's an environment where income inequality is a growing concern, and a lot of folks are pointing the finger at large businesses to pay more. What does the future for funding reform look like in an upcoming legislation, legislative session or on the ballot? So this is one of those multiple session projects, and it always has been. Tom McCall had two major reform ideas, a sales tax that lost basically 90% to 10%, then he came back in 1973 with another idea. It wasn't sales tax. It also was defeated, but multiple projects. Vicatia, same kind of thing, multiple year projects. But it's hard to get them to pass because everything now has to go to the electorate. 
Um, and that's, that's a different dynamic than we used to have. Sales tax clearly has to go in the Constitution if you're gonna do that and make it stick, but other things didn't used to go back to the electorate, they now, everything does. And so he, here's, here's the big issue. We decided long ago as a legislature and then we the voters keep pe putting people back that we would shift the tax burden from the corporations to the individuals. And then we put in ways that we deal with that. So for instance, I live in Washington County. Washington County attracts business with property tax deals and things like that. But then Washington County, according to the legislative rules, then gets to get a, a chunk of the, the income tax of those new workers. So we said, great, the companies, we won't tax as high. Individuals will tax, but we need to get it back to the local level. So we have this way of doing that, okay? So I don't think we're gonna have a major shift back to corporations paying more. It's been a long time, it's hard to put together. I don't think it's gonna work. But what is gonna work? It's, it's, it's hard to do, because often what gets the electorate going about taxes, oh, we need tax reform, then is not there when you actually vote on it 18 months later. And so it just falls apart, you don't get the votes. So here's a fascinating thing about Mark Hass's ideas about the, the, uh, uh, the major 97 ideas and where they go, things like that. That exact idea that was in major 97 was proposed by that radical Democrat, Mark Hatfield, in 1961 and 1963. It was proposed again by that radical Democrat, Vicatia in 1982 and 1983. Didn't go anywhere in either play, either, either case, uh, but it, it, it's fascinating to me to now see that tax, which Atia thought would have been more successful had he labeled it what the national media called it, a flat tax. All of a sudden with that, you get, uh, remember presidential candidates have said we need a flat tax and things like that. Maybe it's more palatable, palatable for people, uh, but it would be then the partisanship would really kick in. Because Democrats would say, oh, Malcolm Forbes, you know, Steve Forbes Jr., we don't want that flat tax, and, and it would be partisanship. So it's really, really, really tough. These big things tend to fail, and then out of them, if there's gonna be tax reform, there will be smaller things that come together that then create the tax reality for the next decade. We haven't seen that huge failure and the pieces being picked up yet. I think Mark Hass is deeply involved in that, but he's gotta get others to really buy into it at this point. For those who aren't uh, Oregon historians like you are, and maybe new to the state, uh, remind us what party were Vicatia and Mark Hadfield? Uh, Vicatia, he, didn't, he never said he was the last Republican mm -hmm. governor. He was the latest Republican governor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Mark Hatfield, of course, uh, a moderate Republican who went on to serve in the Senate for, for decades and decades and decades. But Republicans, kind of from the beginning of a bipartisan time in Oregon, when the Democrats were finally beginning to reassert and, and actually take majorities in legislatures, uh, there was, a, God forbid, a Democratic governor for two years in the 1950s. The Democrats were in control for a much longer period of time than the Democrats have been in control now in Oregon. Um, and so it, it, it was, it was they, they lived in a truly bipartisan time. Neither of them thought that at the time. They thought, my God, why are these people in the House, these Democrats, trying to make me do stuff? Um, but it was definitely a, a different bipartisan time. So continuing taxes, one of the issues that we looked like it might happen this year early on was the kicker. Uh, the kicker did not kick. Uh, and I get asked a lot among um, policymakers, among sort of more informed Oregonians, what's the deal? Is the kicker going to stick around? Do Oregonians really want to use this as uh, in the Constitution? And, and um, what sort of effect does it have on stability of our funding? When we ask about the kicker in our surveys, and there's different ways to ask about it, there's different sort of ways that it could be addressed, but typically we get support of some sort of either elimination or modification of the kicker between 40 and maybe 60 percent. On the lower end, if you ask about, say, reducing, the, getting rid of the kicker altogether, or perhaps getting rid of the kicker for high-income individuals, and maybe some more support if it's framed as getting rid of the kicker and using that money to do something like put it in a K-12 education rainy day fund. So differences, but as someone who's worked on a lot of campaigns and is an observer of uh, politics in the state, 60 percent in a poll usually indicates that it's not going to make it on the ballot. It certainly wouldn't be successful. 
Um, and what I do tell Oregonians who ask me about it and are concerned about the kicker and like to see it go away is that when I ask Oregonians in focus groups about the kicker, the more you explain it to them, the more they like it. Uh, it does seem intuitive to an Oregonian if the state has more money than it says that it needs, that the voters should get it back. Um, but yet it comes up frequently as something that policymakers, legislators would like to modify or get rid of. Uh, what do you see as the future of the kicker in Oregon? The kicker stand. Um, because when you go to the people on the kicker, the people say, boy, every once in a while I get free money, this is good. Um, and, and, and so the kicker's staying. Um, we've already modified it. We've said that the, the corporate kicker is going to be a different beast and we can do different things with it. But remember, corporate taxes are small, so that's a much smaller piece of, piece of the pie when we get to play around with that. So the kicker is staying. Um, you know, it's fascinating doing my research for the Atia book and talking to people. There's kind of three flavors of, of political experts out there in the way they feel about the kicker. So conservative Republicans, so I talked with uh, Republican Bob Smith, who was involved in the kicker, went on and served in Congress. Uh, several other conservatives, a guy named Paul Hanneman, who just died at the coast, uh, who was involved in, in the bottle bill. Um, and they, the kicker, is, is that was the best thing since sliced bread. You know, basically the government was stealing our money. This is a way to keep the government from stealing our money and get it back to us where it counts. Then there's kind of the more moderate Republican, kind of the business Republican. And they look at it and say one of two things. Either the kicker is the leverage we need to actually negotiate real tax reform. They never explain exactly how that's supposed to work, but that's, that's the, the argument. Or they say, well, the kicker has kept Oregon's budget growth from being wildly out of whack. Um, with what it otherwise would have been. Um, on the second one, it's really clear if you look at Oregon's budget growth compared to other states in the country, you can't tell we have a kicker. There's just no difference between the way our budget has gone and other states, except that locally we have to deal with the kicker. Then there are people who, who think that the kicker uh, is, is a bad thing, and they say, you know, it clearly gets in the way of forming a, a government savings account and all those other kinds of things. Um, when the kicker was born, there was an argument that the surplus ought to go for specific things. They talked specifically about K through 12 education and property tax relief. This is back in 1978, of all things. Um, and then the other argument, which won, was no, it should go back to the taxpayers. But that was in a time when we had huge surpluses. Um, since the kicker kicked for the first time in 1985, till now, there's like 17 Viennia in there, and the kicker is kicked 12 times. So clearly, it's, it's there, it's around, it's going to stay, so we just have to figure out how to, how to maneuver around it. i got to tell you, if I were being partisan in Salem, I would say, how can we make the estimate of the state's income a little higher than it really is, so we in effect have that. That's incredibly unethical, but if this were Illinois or New York, they would be doing exactly that. <laughs> so one of the top issues, again, you know, any top issue when we ask, you know, 20% of many of Oregonians will tell us it's the most important issue, um, but one of the top issues that frequently comes up, almost always comes up, is education. And you could divide education in between quality and funding, but if you put that as a bucket together, you usually get about 20% of Oregonians who tell us that's the most important. And you actually, you'll see that elevate at times of the good economy because jobs in the economy as an issue will decline a little bit, so it does go up and down. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened with education this session, but a little bit of context again. So some survey work we did early uh, in February, so at the beginning of the legislative session, we asked, uh, uh, would you, uh, or do you think it's, it's education funding uh, is, is too skimpy, was essentially the, 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 the gist of the question. And about 75% of our Oregonians say, yes, we're not spending enough on education, uh, and that uh, our high school graduation rate is a real problem that needs to be addressed with more funding. But then we ask, are you willing to increase your personal taxes to avoid cuts to the school year or to avoid larger classes? Barely a majority of Oregonians say that they will. Now, they're willing to increase taxes on corporations for that, but barely a majority of Oregonians will. But here's one where there really is a partisan divide, because about 80% of Democrats will raise their hand yes to that question, and just about a third of Republicans will. So what happened this session, and how do those dynamics 
influence what happens in Salem around education. So here's a good way to measure whether or not people are telling the truth when they answer that question. Remember, every time we get a kicker now, there is a movement that says, give your kicker to education. And the amount of money that goes to education is vanishingly small. Um, so people may say they want to raise their taxes in effect, but they end up not doing that. Um, so, so education was actually one of the bipartisan stories of this legislature. In fact, we ended up with a fascinating thing where we had the Republicans arguing that the budget's not high enough, and the Democrats saying, well, but, you know, we look at all the other programs, we have to keep it at this number, and so it was a fascinating dynamic. Um, it, the, the amount in the, in the budget is numerically much larger than it was two years ago, but there's, as always in these things, costs go up, especially healthcare costs and, you know, those kinds of things um, are, go up, and so there we are. In Oregon, uh, we have always considered our K through 12 system chronically underfunded. We're not even gonna get into higher education because we've never funded it for the past 150 years, basically. Um, but but it, it ended up being a fascinating study in the Republicans coming out and saying, you're not good enough on education to the Democrats. And uh, they eventually worked it out and the the deal that they ended up with, as far as I can understand it is, if more money comes in, so the economy continues to perk along and they have a, another estimate of, of what the, the income tax situation is, if more money comes in, they're gonna put it towards education. Um, uh, so it, it, it's, it's fascinating. In effect, the argument was not about taxes this time, it was actually about quality of education. And that's incredibly rare in Oregon for that to happen. Um, I don't know that it will happen in the next biennium or not, but it was, it was just a fascinating dynamic. For those of you listening on OPB, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm John Horbeck, Vice President and Political Director of DHM Research, and I'm here in conversation with Dr. Jim Moore. So I want to talk a little bit about how these folks get elected. So in Oregon, uh, we do register by party. And so you can track party registration easily over time. And we have closed primary elections. So if we look at party registration in Oregon, there was a time when 98% of Oregonians were either a Democrat or a Republican. Today, it's about 65%, 60-65%, with non-affiliated voters, starting really about 20 years ago, really on the, uh, up on the rise, and with the advent of motor voter registration, where new voters registered that way are automatically registered unaffiliated unless they take an additional step, that's increasing rapidly. And so we have a declining portion of the electorate who is eligible to vote in our closed primary elections, uh, which means we have many, probably most, or most races for the legislature effectively decided in our May primary. With that dynamic, first you can challenge whether or not you think that that's right, but what pressures does that put on the, legis the, the, the legislators in Salem that may be different from what Oregonians tell me that they want in my surveys? It actually isn't that bad in Oregon right now, but it was, for instance, around the year 2000. You see the same dynamic that is happening in Congress. If you're a Republican and you're not voting for the repeal of Obamacare, will you get a primary opponent in your safe Republican district? And in Oregon, those same kinds of pressures have existed here. Dennis Richardson, our Secretary of State, is one of those people. There was a Republican in Southern Oregon in the House who voted in a way on abortion that Richardson didn't like so he entered the primary, knocked her off, and won election. And so that, that threat of that primary vote is there. The primary turnout is lower. Uh, in Oregon, we have a whole bunch of districts. So in Portland, they're basically all Democratic, um, especially when you get to Eastern Oregon, except for Bend. Um, and in parts of Southern Oregon, you have districts that are basically gonna be all Republican all the time. Very few swing districts there. Um, and so the, the primary is it. There weren't really any issues this time that would get that base to say, oh gosh, we're gonna challenge you. But remember, two years ago, there were attempts based on gun control legislation to do this, also recall election attempts, all of which kind of failed, but you can see those kinds of things would come up. But what does it do for us? You have legislators who have a different set of reasons for casting votes 
does that then open the door for a primary challenger? Now, still in Oregon, as in the rest of the country, the number one predictor of who's going to win an election is the incumbency. There's just no doubt about it. But it, they can be beat. Um, uh, you know, a, a young lawyer named Ron Wyden was just trying out how to run for Congress as a Democrat and knocked off the incumbent and has served in Congress ever since. Um, so it can happen, and that really puts the fear of God in people. It also means that you have legislators who are paying closer attention to, hmm, when the session's over, who am I going to talk to about fundraising? Because that's a way also to keep those opponents out. Um, but it, it raises different dynamics, and we, the electorate, would really, really pay attention to. Fascinating when you get to the unaffiliated voters, especially. So these are not the independent party who said, most of them, I'm on the independent party. Um, it's not the you know, Pacific Greens. It's the unaffiliated. And nationally, I'm sure Oregon is close to this as well. Nationally, most of them are not really unaffiliated. They're Republicans who just don't want to be registered as Republicans there anymore because they're frustrated. And Democrats, same thing. And so they vote party line, but they don't get to take part in the primary. So it's just, it's a fascinating dynamic. So I'll just add to that a little bit. So you're absolutely right. So in Oregon, with party registration, we can track it, and that's unaffiliated. Uh, uh, can mean that you don't want to affiliate with a party, or um, it can mean something else. Now we just didn't return your voter registration card. But we see nationally, not just with party registration, but people telling pollsters that they don't identify with the Democratic or Republican Party, but that they're independent. That number has been increasing for a long time, and I suspect it will continue to rise. So you may expect, just on that number, that voters would split their ticket more. But in fact, we're seeing less ticket splitting than ever before. In this, the last presidential election, every state that there was a Senate, uh, a race for Senate, every state that Clinton won, the Democratic candidate, Senate candidate won, every state that Trump won, the Republican candidate won. I think that's the first time in about 100 years that that occurred. Less ticket splitting than ever before. So what we're really seeing is a dynamic where I think voters are telling us that they dislike both parties, but they really, really, really dislike <laughs> the other party. And uh, it's that negative partisanship that is driving attitudes and political action uh, more than your uh, wanting a particular outcome for your, 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 wing, your wing or your side. Yeah, and it, it's fascinating here in Oregon, the only place you really see that, or not see that because you don't see it, but you hear it, is conservative talk radio. Um, that's their bread and butter. Um, I, got, I just went to a high school reunion down in southern Oregon, and every time I go down there, people kind of know what I do, and they say, hey, what's going on? So, you know, I'll talk to them a little bit, and then I have to go talk to somebody else. Uh, but there's a, there's a fascinating dynamic. I always get in trouble when I go to southern Oregon, where I'm from, and they say, why don't you pay more attention to name your conservative talk radio show host? And the reason I don't is because I'm paying attention to a lot of stuff, and there's not much evidence that the talk radio show hosts actually move voters in a way that they would not otherwise move. So until I see something weird coming out of that, I got other things to pay attention to than that. If it happens, I will happily start paying more attention to it, but it's, 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 they're kind of feeding themselves. Whereas nationally, with Fox and MSNBC and all those kinds of things, man, it's, it's the all, the other party is bad all the time show. And you get to watch it every day, and, and you, know, you can you know, figure out what the president is tweeting at you and all those other kinds of things. So it's a different dynamic with television and the national politics. In California, they have a similar thing because they do have enough local shows in those big, giant cities where there are television things going on. But in the rest of the country, it's a fascinating, only on the right side of the scale do we see that with talk radio. Remember, liberal talk radio kind of came and went and didn't really make any difference. So with this negative partisanship, just another observation that, that I see is that uh, it drives campaigns to do more work to get turnout on their side and much less work than on persuasion. Yeah. Um, so I'll make one other point about voter registration that I just want us to consider is that the electorate, the primary electorate for partisan elections is sh shrinking as a matter of the number of Democrats and Republicans, but it's not random. So non or 18 to 29 year olds, about 50% are non-affiliated versus just about 20% of 65 plus. 
And so the issues and responsiveness to the electorate is not only D versus R, but there are other demographic characteristics and, and priorities among those primary voters. Let's sort of look ahead. So we just wrapped up the 2017 legislative session, but now Oregon has moved to annual sessions and we will have a session uh, in early 2018. Given what happened this year, given what events may occur over the next several months, what are you looking forward to coming in 2018? So we'll see if Mark Hass can get a posse together and seriously talk about the next stage of tax reform. That's what people are going to be paying a lot of attention to. And remember, the 2018 session is just before the deadline to file for office. So you, that's when you watch and say, am I going to do something? So I'm going to get a, a surprise filer against me. But we'll see what happens with that. We're also going to see um, a lot of people involved with health care, like Mitch Greenlick, were happy with what happened, but there's still things that were left on the table, and they're going to get their work together to say, let's try to get that health care package together, um, taxes with different organizations, and you know, a, a lot of complex things there. But the, the, specials, the, the special, the short session is kind of geared for those kinds of cleanup operations. Um, so we'll see. What we hope we don't see is what we've seen last short session and the one before that, there really wasn't a focus. And so they came in and there was a whole bunch of different things and it clear that they, the leadership had not said, wow, we're gonna focus on these four things and that's it. Um, and so it took, in effect, a week of the four for them to figure out what they were doing and then move on. And so uh, we'll watch for that kind of dynamic. You can see as a leader though, you might want that to happen so that not too much incredibly uh, bad for the election is gonna happen during that session. So there's wheels within wheels here. But especially look for tax reform to make an advance and look for, for health to make advances there as well. Now let's go to aud the audience for some questions. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for staff to collect. You can also submit questions through Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. And I'll try to read at least one index card question and one from Twitter. We invite City Club members to ask their questions at the microphone. Asking a question at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership. Membership is open to everyone. Please identify yourself as a, as a City Club member and remember to ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Charles Raghi, a City Club member. Um, you, this is about bipartisanship and I guess one thing that I haven't heard is the word stewardship as a <coughs> aspect that people typically associate with bipartisanship and uh, SPURS is only interesting to 2% of the population supposedly uh, but it seems like a classic stewardship question uh, and one that needs to be dealt with so that the public can be served as it's gobbling up the budget. Yeah, the, ho the whole concept of stewardship, of thinking long term about what's good for the state of Oregon as an organization, as a government entity, as a place to live, um, that, that's a tough one. And in the, the, a lot of the partisanship at the, in the legislature drives against that, drives against that very thing. So the PERS conversation right now, there's agreement that there's a problem, but there's not an agreement on what the problem is, and certainly not an agreement on what any of the solutions are. So the stewardship has to take another step. That's where we see those multiple session ideas, putting together in a coalition, putting the, together those ideas, and building the bipartisanship it will take to pass things. Um, it, it, it's a tough, tough thing. Stewardship is tough right now. It seems to reside in some people who've been there a long time. Peter Courtney will talk about stewardship until you know, the cows come home. Uh, but it, it's harder to get that going. That's where, in the past, people have looked to a strong governor to do that. Um, and I'm not saying Kate Brown is a weak governor, but it's also an issue that hasn't really come up in those terms. Um, so, so look for more of that, but that might be Mark Cass building a coalition, looking at tax reform, where that kind of idea might come together. My name is Jean Magmer, and my business is helping local governments with their bond elections, providing they do research-based elections. And I just recently helped the Albany School District pass a tax increase. And um, I just finished analyzing a survey for the Salem School District, which indicates that they have a better than 60% chance of passing 
a bond measure with a tax increase. And of course, Salem, uh, Portland just passed a major increase for bonds. Are you gentlemen watching that trend? And does that have any hope for the state legislature in addressing the corporate tax issue? Well, let me tackle the first part of that. Um, this last May, sort of unnoticed in the national, or excuse me, the statewide press, and so the statewide conversation, Oregonians passed over a billion dollars worth of bonds for schools. So Portland Public, Lake Oswego, and Bend La Pine. Uh, so local school districts, local communities did take action on their own to raise their taxes. We are at a particular moment where the economy is doing relatively well. We've certainly seen bond measures in school districts and other places fail in the past. Um, so uh, th this may be the, the time to strike while the iron is hot with the economy. Uh, and perhaps that will give confidence to, to the legislature going forward if they are observing local elections where local voters are uh, being willing to step up. Uh, and so we'll just have to continue watching the dynamic. If they were failing, I think they would certainly signal to the legislature that this is not a time to raise taxes. Not only did those big bonds pass, but Josephine County, which is the poster child for we won't fund anything, actually funded some stuff. So yeah, there's, there's, there's some change going on, but historically it's actually, we, it's hard to see how those local measures then get into the legislature. It's in fact, there's a lot of time a different dynamic going on there. So if you want those bond measures, you can hope. Leslie Johnson, City Club member. Um, we had a top two primary on the ballot about 10 years ago and I was a member of the research committee. We, the proponents, primary argument was that enacting the top two primary would reduce pardon partisanship. They made that argument vit vigorously, but they didn't come up with much in the way of evidence that that would be the case. And the committee did some research on its own to look for historic enactments of that and didn't find anything that really persuaded them. But I've thought about that a lot since then because we've been so vigorously going the wrong direction on that subject since that was on the ballot. When I hear you talk about things like fewer split tickets and uh, uh, the uh, people, the parties focused on getting out their own vote rather than persuading, it makes me think even more or look back even more on the arguments on that subject. Do you think that if we'd passed a tap, top two primary at that point, uh, at least Oregon would be in a different place? Does that? present a prospect for something that would start a movement the other direction now, or is there anything that could change, begin to change that uh, trend? So the top two primaries on the ballot about 10 years ago, I can't remember what year, but then it was also on the ballot in 2014. Both times it failed miserably, and in full disclosure, I worked on the 2014 campaign. Um, the you know, Oregonians pretty overwhelmingly twice in the last decade have said no to the top two. So I don't really think that it's a likely uh, uh, thing that Oregonians are going to endorse, at least in the short term. I sort of come back to my point, though, that the, with Motor Voter, um, we're seeing a tremendous increase in unaffiliated voters. In February, non-affiliated voters passed Republicans in terms of there's more non-affiliated voters than there are Republicans. In the next year, year and a half, if the trends continue, non-affiliated voters will pass Democrats. In a closed primary state, I don't really see uh, our systems being compatible with one another. So I do suspect there'll be some change. I'm doubtful right now that it'll be top two, that it'll be something else. That was one of the arguments. I do think that the evidence is mixed or weak. It, it is difficult to, to measure. Um, but increase the number of people who can vote in the primary is probably a good thing on its own. Yeah, all you have to do is look north to Washington and south to California, and partisanship has not diminished there because of their top two systems. So here's a question, here's a question from Twitter. From, I believe it's at Westcon, if I'm reading that correctly. What can non-affiliated voters do to affect the prospects of bipartisanship? So that's a great question. So non-affiliated voters um, can't make a difference if they basically tend to vote on the party lines that they say they're not part of. Um, but if they truly come together, and you heard in, in Oregon, non-affiliated are gonna be the biggest single chunk of voters out there. If those non-affiliated voters come together behind a candidate, 
then you've got something. We've seen this in other states. This is part of the political culture of Maine, for instance, where they have independents who run and win for, for the primary or for the uh, governorship. Uh, it was in Oregon and during the Great Depression. Julius Meyer, as in Meyer and Frank, was an independent, uh, beat the Republican and the Democrat, came in there and, and served. Uh, he was fascinating because he didn't like to go to Salem, so he hung out at his place up in the gorge uh, and sent his driver back and forth to Salem with important papers. Um, but So we've seen that in times of stress in Oregon where, where people say, wow, we're gonna support something different. But until that comes together, it's hard to see it happening. Nationally, you remember, remember in 2000, there was an idea with Al Gore and George Bush kind of chugging along towards the nomination. Boy, will Colin Powell be kind of this independent force that would get the unaffiliateds and get those who were disaffected from both parties. It didn't happen. It takes a person like that. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the former wrestler who was the governor of Minnesota in the same circumstances, but it takes, you gotta have a person to make all that come together. Hi, I'm Kathy Moyd, a member of the City Club. I'm also active with the Citizens Climate Lobby, and we've been focusing on the national level but after the November election, we've decided that we probably need to do more focusing on the state level. And I'm just wondering what the impact of citizen lobbyists is on getting things through the state legislature. The impact is good as long as you're organized and you figure out how to actually do it. Citizen lobbyists that have been doing a couple of sessions are just as good at it as the regular lobbyists. Um, their shoes aren't quite as shiny, but you know, they, they, they know how to do it. Um, and, and remember, the key thing with lobbying is you're providing information. That's, that's your currency. And if your information is good, and if you can do something else, if you can show I can also help mobilize voters to get things to happen, that gives you more power to do it. You know, the whole climate issue is fascinating. Clearly, the federal government has decided to go a different direction. Um, California, Washington are kind of leading the states in response. Oregon's a little bit behind that. Um, but remember, with the, it, under the leadership of California, we're all part of a compact that includes a couple of provinces from Canada and things like that. So, and we're seeing this worldwide. Cities and the equivalent of states are becoming the leaders on a lot of climate change issues. Um, and we'll see what happens with that. But citizen legislators or ci citizen lobbyists are a crucial part of that, just as long as you're organized and you've got good information. Uh, Kurt Wabering, member. <coughs> um, when you do polling and focus groups, you uh, obviously identify people by um, whether they're Democrat or Republican <coughs> age and so forth. Um, what about? Uh, I have two groups that I'm interested in, uh, minorities, and the other is the non-one percenters, that is, poor people. Sure, so when I do surveys, it depends on the issue, depends on the client and the time. There are certainly times when we do surveys where our goal is to have a sample that is representative of the general population, in which case we're trying to get the right number of folks who are you know, 18 to 34, or the right number of people who uh, so have low incomes or high incomes, you know, matched to census. Those surveys are much more diverse than when we're asked to do a survey of likely voters. Likely voters are significantly older, significantly more partisan, have higher incomes, are more likely to own a home, and are whiter. When a campaign or a candidate is trying to get something accomplished where they depend on likely voters, they tend to do survey research with those, with those, uh, with those audiences. And, and those are the ones that legislators and a lot of their elected officials are responsive to. This is an age old issue. The reason why social security is such a big issue is because people near social security age or in social security age vote. Younger groups don't vote. So we're not gonna hear about as big an issue about how do I get my first job, paying off my student loans, things like that. They just don't turn out to vote. In the, Port in the Portland metro area, nearly half or maybe is half now of those who are under 18 are from communities of color. If we look at you know, Oregon as a whole, 
If we look at four or four voters, those are the voters who have voted in all four of the last four elections, basically those voters who show up at the general and the primary. Yes. 55% over 65. That, that population is quite a bit different than our under 18 population. Ted Kay, City Club member. Short question and I hope a long answer. What's it going to take to fix the PERS problem in Oregon? Yes. Uh, well, it's going to take acknowledging what the problem is. Right now we have kind of three groups talking about it. There are the actuaries. So they're talking about it and they have a good handle and all those kinds of things. Then there's the politicians and the politicians may or may not have a good handle on what's really going on, but there are a lot of politically useful ways of using the argument and making the argument. Then there are the people who get PERS, who are basically terrified there's gonna be some kind of a change that's gonna change you know, the amount of money they get in retirement or anything like that. There's a fourth group out there, which is the Oregon Supreme Court, which keeps consistently saying you can't go back on contracts. And so in all of that, you've got to have the actuaries and the political class have got to come together on what the problem is and then say, okay, is this a big fix? So we need to change radically uh, um, you know, the amount that people get we need to change the assumptions about what the earnings are going to be in a big way. Or is this a little change? We need to tinker with what we assume the, the average age of people when they die in the system is or something like that. At this point, those, those things just really aren't being talked about in the political side of things. So I, I don't see any PERS solution coming until we get those two groups to talk on the same page. I think it's going to take a long time. I'm going to add a fifth group, the voters. Yep. Until voters see that they're being affected, now they are, but until they really see it, and there's a through line between what happens in Salem, what happens with PERS, and what happens with their local government, and those potholes that get fixed on their street. Until that happens, it's gonna be very difficult to build the public will, the voter demand for the legislator to do something. Yep. Charles, Ra Charles Raghi again, uh, City Club member. Uh, you mentioned closed primaries, and we're dealing with a lot of pro partisanship, an enormous unaffiliated group. Why not open up the primaries to the unaffiliated? Choose one of the two primaries you want to vote in. In Oregon, those decisions are made by each political party, and the Republicans have at various and sundry times said it's to our advantage to open them up and then close them, and the Democrats have said it's to our advantage to open them up and then close them. Um, we treat them as basically private clubs, and they get to make the choices this might be a place where the legislature could say, we'll take control of those primaries away from you, but that would be a whole can of worms that people don't want to get into. Good solution, but getting it done is tough. Thank you. We are out of broadcast time and we'll have to stop for today. If this program has inspired you to join or contribute to City Club, you can do so at the registration table as you leave the room. This is Lisa Watson from City Club's Board of Governors. Thank you to our guests, and special thanks to Walter Robinson II and the whole Friday Forum Committee. This program's adjourned.